So on this slide, it says that we're avoiding caribou biosciences stock. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the word avoid. So here at Nanalyze, we don't assume that the reader or listener has any sort of background knowledge that would be required to understand what we're presenting, whether that's finance or technology or anything related to the thesis or the technology that underlies it. So when we say that we're avoiding caribou biosciences, that means that it's a stock we wouldn't consider buying for any number of reasons that we'll discuss today. The first and foremost being that it's too small. So we only invest in companies that have a market cap of a billion dollars or more. So the three classifications that we have, just so that you're aware, in our 436 tech stock catalog, every single one of those firms has one classification. If we love it, that means we're holding it. Now, a love doesn't necessarily mean that we would be buying more of it, but it happens to be in our portfolio and our thesis hasn't changed because if our thesis did change, then we would be exiting the stock. That's one of two reasons that we exit a stock, let's say a disruptive tech stock. If growth stalls or our thesis changes, then we have likes. These are firms that we would consider holding, but don't for any number of reasons. And as I said, avoids firms that we would not consider investing in caribou being one of them. Now, we did a piece not too long ago about 27 gene editing stocks, and we pulled this comprehensive list together and then went through and started filtering out the rubbish. And we ended up with a number of names that we wanted to explore further. Uh, two of those we happen to love, and the rest we've published pieces on how we feel about these companies. And the one that's left, you can see Caribou Biosciences is one of the smaller ones. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. Now, when we evaluate gene editing firms, there's, they're quite unique for a number of reasons. First of all, they're very technically complex. So we want to try to come up with a methodology that helps us navigate that. And we also don't invest pre-revenue uh, we don't buy into firms that unless they have meaningful revenues. And I think a lot of these firms do, but um, some don't. And we're making an exception to our rule because I think if you're going to invest in gene editing, you're going to have to take on a lot of risk. These firms seem to resemble more like drug developers than software companies. I think if you looked at like a Schrodinger, then maybe that's, well, we're, uh, to be fair, we love Schrodinger. That uh, means we're holding it. but. Um, Schrodinger's not gene editing, but it's in kind of that similar universe and it's more of a software company, AI drug discovery, right? That's pretty interesting stuff, even though some of those firms have sporadic or no revenue. So um, when it comes to investing, we take a very risk averse approach. And as I said, we wouldn't invest in Caribou because of their size, but when we evaluate them, uh, here's the methodology that we're going to use. So. We focus on the lead candidate. The idea there is that if they can't make the lead work, the rest behind it's probably does not gonna not gonna fare so well because a lot of focus is placed on that lead. And if they muck something up, or in the case of Editas, when their partner backs out, that's not a good sign for a lead candidate. So that's another red flag that we look at. And I think one of those firms, it could be CRISPR, had Bayer back out. And we noted that as a red flag. Whenever you have a large pharmaceutical company back out, it's not good. Of course, these large pharma companies, you know, they're only one org chart change away from cutting off a partnership. Again, something that makes these um, relationships, these gene editing firms, how they operate very risky. So you could expect a lot of volatility. We don't invest in drug developers because we don't like uh, regulatory risk because it presents a lot of uncertainty, which translates to volatility. So as study results are being made known, then you see these firms usually move in unison and quite dramatically. So investing in one is sort of an equivalence class in that they're being traded as a bucket. So um, these two individuals, it's a real shame that our society doesn't idolize scientists. Instead, they idolize people who play games for a living or movie stars whose sole job is to pretend to be somebody they're not. If we did idolize scientists, then these women would be a household name. The woman on the left, I'm not going to butcher her name, but she is the founder of, I believe it's CRISPR. 
And the lady on the right, that's Jennifer Dudna. She's a co-founder of Caribou. Actually, that other lady is a, a co-founder as well. But um, Jennifer's also co-founded a number of other companies as have most uh, high profile individuals in the gene editing ar arena. And what's quite notable about these two individuals is that they were jointly awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2020, the only case of two individual persons being female and receiving a Nobel Prize, and that was for their work in gene editing. So they certainly have the technical acumen needed to propel their companies forward, though not all technical founders uh, make good CEOs. So Caribou is working on what they say, redefining CAR T cell therapies with enhanced persistence. Well, what's a CAR T cell therapy? We spent some time looking at this not too, well, it was actually quite a while ago, and it's extraordinarily complex stuff. And I think back then we were trying to figure out if that was the sort of thing that we wanted to invest in. And it was a drug discovery, drug developer sort of play. And we, um, we sort of, uh, gravitated away from it because it was so technically complex. And I've tried here to simply explain it as uh, deep as my understanding goes. It's a treatment in which a patient's T cells, it's a type of immune cell, are changed in a laboratory so they will bind to cancer cells and kill them. So you use the patient cells, that's one way. And then allogenic, that's when you take cells from a donor. So this particular approach has actually been successful. You can see the US FDA has approved six CAR T cell therapies, the names of which are listed here. And Caribou is developing in all three of their programs, CAR T therapies for patients with blood cancers whose disease has come back despite undergoing other treatments or they didn't respond to those treatments in the first place. And what they're targeting with their lead candidate is non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. This is a type of cancer that begins in your lymphatic system. Uh, it's the most common blood-related malignancy, estimated 4% of all cancer cases in the United States. And of those, 80 to 85% are this type B, and that's the uh, type that Caribou is targeting with their CB010 compound that um, they're currently in, in um, I believe it's phase one. So you see here that um, this is a slide taken from their investor deck and they've taken adults who have failed two lines of chemotherapy and then subjecting them to this, their own therapy. And you could see here how they're escalating doses. We see that quite common, right? They'll start out at a particular dosage and then they'll move that up. You could see here, they're currently dosing at level two, then they'll move to level three. In this part A, you see the primary objective is safety and tolerability. And the secondary objective is efficacy. Does it actually work? Then they move to part B, which takes the dose that the optimal dose that they figure out in part A and subjects patients to that in part B. And then efficacy is the primary objective to make sure the thing works. So their study is called Antler and you can pull the study up yourself and see where they're at. And they released some results this year that had, um, I guess, mixed results. So initially things were looking pretty good. And then this article in Fierce Biotech uh, talks about how there's been a relapse for half of the patients. Well, some of the analysts looking at this said, well, you know, they're only at the lower dose. So if we go to, you know, dose level two or three, then that could certainly drive longer lasting responses. So it's really all hinging on the success of this, um, these trials that they're running and they're going at it alone. So they don't have a partner and that's Whenever we see, you know, you have the similar case with Editas and their partner pulled out for their lead drug. Whenever you have a company going at it alone, it's expensive, it's difficult, and in, that's where Caribou sits. They're going to need a fair amount of money to be progressing that study. Though they do have partners, and we were looking through their filings and came across something interesting. Back in 2014, they cross-licensed their 
intellectual property portfolio with Intellia. So it was kind of the same terms both ways. You, know, you can use ours, we can use yours. And then more recently, they revised that in 2018, following some sort of questions around what was included in that original deal. And now it says we will owe Intellia low to mid single digit percent royalties on net sales of our CB10 product candidate. So if you hold Intellia, you stand to benefit uh, and that benefit will be a gross margin of 100% on this uh, licensing deal. And this will probably be of interest to people trying to figure out who's the winner when it comes to intellectual property. And that's just really a crapshoot at the moment. So we found that interesting. And then, of course, when Abvi left Editas, they moved to Caribou. And when they did, they said they would develop two new CAR T cell therapies and that these programs, the two programs could expand to four. So watch for payments that come from AVI. So those would be milestone payments that shows things are progressing. If AVI decides to increase the number of programs, that's a promising sign. So that's the big partner that they have. And then regards to what else they're doing, uh, you know, this antler study, as we said, it's gonna get increasingly expensive as time goes on. They don't have a farmer partner for their lead candidate to help share the cost, but they're only burning $20 million a quarter. So as of the end of last quarter, let's say they have around $400 million in cash. That gives them, what, 20 quarters? I mean, they, they've got quite a bit of runway, though uh, that will get more expensive as they progress in terms of their clinical trials. One other thing we noted in their uh, 10Q is this mention of an inclusion committee, something you probably shouldn't be wasting their time on. And they made this statement. They said, there's still more work to be done until the diversity of our workforce matches the diversity of the Bay Area. Well, let's just hope they don't move cities. If they move their headquarters over to Texas, then they're going to have to recalibrate their entire team to match the diversity of whatever city they move to. Okay, absolutely ridiculous. The goal is always moving and you'll never reach it. And we still owe our listeners a detailed presentation on why we believe things like DEI are a detriment to shareholders and breach of fiduciary responsibility. So at any rate, the conclusion is that there doesn't have to be a single winner when it comes to gene editing. So you could take the spray and pray approach, which is what we originally did and invest in a handful of stocks, or you can try to be more selective and pick those that appear to be furthest along. So when you look at a firm like CRISPR or Intellia, and you see them saying things like, well, we pretty much cured 30 people, that's progress. So those are the sorts of, those are the sorts of big news items that, that attract investors and provide the funding because these firms you know, often need funding and that's drying up. So when they make progress that's um, at such a big deal, then a lot of investors will come around and you'll be able to raise funding a lot easier. And then of course, these stocks, as we said earlier, they move together as information becomes available. So you have to be prepared for a lot of volatility. I know that we've trimmed our uh, gene editing positions when I think, um, was it CRISPR was up over 1200%. And that's probably a wise thing to do when there's a lot of hype, at least recoup your cost basis and you're playing with the house's money. So we're invested in gene editing, but Caribou isn't a gene editing company we'd consider investing in. So please put your comments in the comments section. Make sure to subscribe to our channel. And thanks so much for taking the time to watch this video today.